Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Carlo, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I see in the audience a lot of old friends uh, and new faces, and I've really enjoyed the discussions we've had so far today. Uh, I'm a bit of a departure, I guess, to some extent from what we've been hearing so far today because I'll, I'll confess off the top, I mean, I, I do have, I am a student of Greg Albo's, I did acquire skills as a political economist, but that's not my strength uh, as a researcher. I'm more of a political sociologist interested in the study of social movements and the formation of protests, and I'm particularly interested in education and capacity building for leadership in new forms of resistance and protests, and I've spent spent a lot of time in the labor movement for a relatively young person, seven years, um, engaged in that. So I guess you could summarize my presentation, which you'll see in the agenda is called Transcending Neoliberalism One Story at a Time, as a story about a campaign which hopes to draw on labor's potential, uh, to look past, if you like, the, the past laments and slogans that we may have had about the capacity for unions to resist and effectively campaign against austerity, and draws it back to what I would argue uh, is the central source of power for the labor movement beyond its resources, uh, people. People right across this country, 3.4 million union members, who themselves are passionate, themselves are engaged, uh, but often rarely tapped and utilized given the professionalized nature of union campaigning today. So the story I'm going to tell you about the pension campaign the CLC uh, authored and rolled out between the years of 2008 and 2010 mm -hmm. is, I would argue, a bit of a departure from the professionalized model of how unions have been doing campaigns and suggestive of how we can actually engage in resistance against austerity measures going forward. I'll also begin with an assertion, maybe because our blood sugar levels are dropping uh, following lunch. If I'm to frame my concerns, um, given my experience in the labor movement, about how we're fighting austerity, I would frame it this way. I would say if we have a crisis, it's not only in thinking about alternatives. I actually think if you look uh, at blogs right up to formal union publication, there's, there's a dearth of, there's not a dearth, excuse me, of alternatives and ideas. But where I see, um, gaping holes is an urgency. Urgency and a willingness to take risks, and particularly to invest money, resources, and time in everyday union members to engage in those risks as, as active members of campaigns. So I'll just put that out there for our collective edification as I, as I roll forward. What I want to end with, too, after telling the story with this campaign, is an example of an entirely different campaign that came out of the province of Quebec in the run-up to the not recent federal election, but the one before that, which had a profound effect on the election itself. So I hope to end there. And I'm told the audio is working, so we can actually, thanks to our friends here. Uh, so I mean, when I was asked uh, with my fellow researchers to pan out across the country in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, and Toby was doing this work too, and trying to explain to union activists, leadership at a local and regional level, why we were engaged in such a dramatic fight and why we'd seen the bottoming out of markets, literally half of the bottom being cut out of capital markets. Uh, this was my favorite illustration as an educator. I believe in the power of image as much as words um, to demonstrate the bankruptcy of thought behind what we called in our literature the fend for yourself economy, what friends in this room, more of an academic audience, would call neoliberalism. Um, and just to, to really Focus the mind on the fact that now was the time, if there ever was a time, to dive into the breach and begin putting forward solidaristic alternatives about how you could build solidaristic public policy initiatives. This was the time. Because the neoliberal arguments to reshape labor markets, to reshape financial markets, um, had shown themselves to be utterly bankrupt. So we were in a situation where, specifically for the pension system, we built up a pension system which was entirely based, to a large extent, on volunteerism. Generations of union activists, the feminist movement, uh, many other movements contributed to what we know today as the Canada Pension Plan, the Quebec Pension Plan, the basic building block frameworks of uh, old age security and some programs like the Guaranteed Income Supplement. That had been achieved, but by and large, capital, particularly finance capital and the insurance industries and banking industries, had succeeded in leaving a lot of room open for people to fend for themselves and buy individual retirement products, 
to top up what was a very low floor. As we modeled it for people in place after place, we basically said that on average, if you look at average CPP, QPP, public pension related incomes, the average income in pay to seniors right now is about $11,000 a month pre-tax. Average incomes. A year. A year. A year. And mouths would always drop until conversations would be initiated about people they knew in their communities and their towns. And we began to pick apart the reality that governments were often promoting retirement incomes, uh, and people uh, like Don Drummond do this on a regular basis, ditto for his friend Jack Mintz at the University of Calgary, where uh, maximum pensionable incomes were, were articulated. And they do this for public service pensions as well. But when they began to piece together that story, they began to realize that this image was a really great one to capture how the fend for yourself market, the RRSP market, which not only is an intrusion in our lives, but is, is a massive sucking force of wealth from people's retirement incomes. We showed folks models, and uh, a tool exists on the CLC website for people to avail themselves of even now, where you can actually see what a 2.5% management expense ratio, this is the language of the mutual fund industry, will do to somebody's RRSP over a 40 year career, essentially siphoning out you know, 40 to 52% of your retirement pool. So this was a good basis on which to begin the, the anger part of the session, um, <laughs> to tap into the legitimate anger that we were hearing. And then we would talk about how the system wasn't failing everyone. It was failing the vast majority of people. It was failing the 99%. Even those of us in the labor movement who managed to negotiate decent workplace pensions to top up that very low floor, we were under political attack because most people didn't have those benefits. But the pension system worked very well for some people. And while we were doing our town halls and spanning it across the country, attempting to connect and mobilize and interest union members in fighting in our pension campaign, we pointed this example out because a similar panel was crisscrossing the country, sponsored by the federal government, headed by this guy, Don Stewart, is the CEO of Sun Life, whose estimated pension at the time when we ran these numbers in 2009 was going to be worth $1.4 million a year. And if you parse through that particular annual report, what Sun Life was disclosing to shareholders was the fact that they were trumpeting the fact that new hires at Sun Life were going to be enrolled into a defined contribution pension program, not a defined benefit program where your pension is predictable, in order to ensure that the company was going to be as productive and attractive as possible for investment. So here was a guy crisscrossing the country, lecturing people effectively on how they needed to be more financially literate. It was a panel on financial literacy enjoying a very handsome pension on his own, and effectively creating, uh, as we've seen at Valley Inco, as we've seen in so many other fights, uh, a fractured workplace where certain people are going to enjoy one set of pension benefits and another, uh, a dramatically different set of benefits. We also found out that year, thanks to the hard work from Jackie McNish and other um, business reporters at the Global Mail, that the average CEO pension in pay averaged around $930,000 a year. So we, we tried to demonstrate to people that this is a class war, that this is a situation where a system has been built up, not on a conspiratorial basis, but because one side had been persuasively winning people to that old Canadian idea of self-reliance and thrift, and had forcibly and effectively lobbied the public pension and mandatory pension system to be kept at a very low level. So we had a choice at this point in the campaign, and I was one of the people at the Congress, and Toby was somebody at QP, uh, and Chris at the OFL that made a very clear argument within the labor movement that we needed to avoid taking this information into a glossy leaflet format and giving people talking points fed to them where they needed to regurgitate in meeting with parliamentarians uh, to, to trump the campaign effectively. For this campaign to work, we argue, we needed to have people's actual stories come across in meetings with their elected representative, if those meetings went nowhere, as so many of them did, then we could move to a stage where rallies and occupations and sit-ins could actually find their way into the campaign. And I'm going to share with you some of the stories that we harvested as we hosted town hall after town hall across the country. Uh, my partner will tell you there were some weeks in the years of 2008, 2009 where I was in three or four different Canadian cities in a given week with this kind of work. It was, it was feverish and it was expensive. Uh, but we were trying to articulate this idea, this, this idea that you could actually restructure the Canadian pension system on the notion of a Medicare model, where you had a higher floor for everyone, not just for union workers. It was one of the big achievements of the pension campaign that we won the labor movement, not to a message of let's defend our own workplace pensions, 
but let's improve the candidate for that pension plan. That's the core message. Oh, it is, well, oh, there we are. All right. Okay, I want to introduce you to uh, somebody I met from Nakawick, New Brunswick. People are familiar with that part of the country. It's a pulp and paper town. And this is Loretta Kent, uh, who's a CAW activist. And this particular plant, uh, which is now called AV Pulp and Paper, it used to be called CN Pulp and Paper, had gone through a restructuring in 2004, where five years before that restructuring, their pension, given a lot of vigilance from uh, Loretta and some of her colleagues, uh, was 92% funded. On the heels of the bankruptcy, the pension was 62% funded. The company went through the bankruptcy, essentially having shortchanged the pension fund by minimally funding it year upon year, they came out of the pension, they came out of that restructuring with a brand new company still producing very attractive product, but workers took massive hits in their pension. In Loretta's case, she had 16 years of service, and the commuted value of her pension payout at the end of this process for her service to date, her 16 years of service to date, was $400. <laughs> That's not $400 a month or $400 a year. 16 years of service, $400. And we use this example to talk to politicians in the Maritimes about the need to have some urgency on protecting people's deferred wages. And we wove it into the fabric of our campaign. Uh, this is Barb, and Barbara's from Sudbury. She's a registered practical nurse that works in seniors' homes. Interestingly, she is part of the story that's not very well known for Terence Corcoran and the folks that like to bash public sector workers constantly in the media. She doesn't have a pension, and she's a public sector worker who is unionized. Uh, and her story for women workers in the um, ass assisted care living sector was that this was a very common phenomenon. And if you actually look at QP and SEIU and other unions that are attempting to organize, some of the fastest rates of growth in pension plans, like the multi-sector pension plan, uh, is with exactly this demographic of worker. But it, it underlines the fact that even within our labor movement, we have 20% of unionized workers with no pension whatsoever. And Barb used her story to contribute to that aspect of the campaign. In Windsor, Ontario, we held a capacity hall meeting. This is on the heels of the auto crisis and the pension imbroglio that happened, you may remember over that, um, where CW444 and 200 uh, canvassed very widely in their community to bring forward pension stories to put a hell of a lot of pressure on Dwight Duncan. And this story was one that left many of us uh, short of eye moisture, having uh, had much draw from her face, Gail Clark told a story about being a unionized cook in a retirement home at $17 an hour with the SEIU at one point. But when the home had closed down, she could no longer find work, given kind of own family dislocation issues. She didn't have a lot of support. She sold her assets, she sold her home, anything that wasn't tied down. She was forcibly cutting her own prescription drugs that she depended upon for survival because she didn't have enough money to pay for them. Um, she was using food banks, living in a tiny apartment, and lived on an after-rent budget of $300 a month. And that was her reality as somebody looking towards retirement as a very recent union member. We used this story to wage battle against the Jack Minces of the world, the Terence Corcoran's of the world, that would like Canadians to believe that unions simply live with a silver spoon on retirement income issues. We used this story to connect with a much more real reality, which is that we feel the impacts of the inadequacy of the pension system often as much as the non-union population. This young man's name is Colin, and Colin's mom is a QP member working at a group home in a place called uh, Lanark County, which is not far from Ottawa. It's about a 45, 50 minute drive from Ottawa, Lanark County Community Living Services. Uh, you might read his placard. I love homemade placards as a rule. The Occupy movement was terrific for this. It reads, QP, I shouldn't be my mom's pension plan. And in this particular situation, this group of workers was fighting an employer that was sitting on millions of dollars of money given to them from the Ontario Liberals, specifically for wage and compensation issues. And many homes like this home had used this money to introduce group RSPs or some meager amount of retirement security planning. But this group had proposed this, tabled this as a bargaining proposal, and this employer had said, by no means are we going to allow you to continue with this. If you continue with this demand, you're going to be walking in circles outside. And for 10 weeks, they did precisely that. For 10 weeks, they walked outside in circles, and the resolution was a group RSP. It was much, much of a climb down from what they were hoping to get with the more secure pension arrangement. But this is the largest public sector union of which I come from, and 
Toby proudly serves, in the country, <laughs> that is fighting in a context of some wealth over pension adequacy. So we harvested stories like these and hundreds more to build the strength of this campaign. And what I would tell you today is that that's why this campaign was as dynamic as it was. And uh, I'll, I'll end with, with a couple of observations before showing this video, which I hope to show. Um, how do I say this? I think sometimes we overcomplicate campaigns in the labor movement. Uh, there is a very real problem of treating research as if it was polling and not investing research monies and insights into how we can tap the dynamism and creativity of our members. For me, the high water mark of this campaign, which has subsided dramatically since, uh, was in 2010 right here in the city where we had had enough of these town halls, built enough anger and capacity, leadership capacity at a local level, where we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people engaged every day with appeals to their politicians or rallies or sit-ins involved in that kind of agitation and activity. And we dared industry to debate us here in the city of Toronto at Sutton Place in a pension summit. And Catherine Swift from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business showed up. Jim Flaherty showed up. A number of pension specialists showed up. We stared them down. We argued with them. We filled this hall to over 600 people. We wanted to have this fight. And I can't tell you how many union staff I argued with in the run-up to that summit saying, are we really prepared for this? What if we lose? What if we're not ready? Isn't this taking a big risk? And I was very, very proud to be among the people in the labor room saying, if we don't take this risk and trust our people to articulate their lived realities into this campaign, we are dead. If we try to punch blows with governments in the media and assume that that's a campaign, we're dead. We have anger, we have motivation, we have trained people, let's unleash them. And we did. And it was, uh, it was a phenomenal day. And I want to see more of those things. Um, I'll end with uh, this short clip, Brian, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, this, to my mind, is the most effective campaign that I've seen in recent memory in Canada. And it was directed at the Harper government. Uh, it was Quebec artists who actually were fighting over a relatively minimal amount of money. And you may remember the Prime Minister lamenting federal Heritage Canada dollars going into taxpayer-funded balls and galas, and how this unleashed, because he doesn't, I still believe he doesn't understand Quebec, this unleashed a wave of furor, because so many people's livelihoods in the province of Quebec have been built up, ironically enough, many sovereignists from federal dollars, right? <laughs> Um, and even among the more successful ones, like you'll see featured in this clip, Michel Rival from the band Beaudemage, uh, he and many others joined a campaign aimed precisely at one thing, articulating the message that every dollar that's invested in arts and entertainment yields an $11 spin-off. And you'll see the tagline at the end of this clip. But they use one of the most potent and powerful weapons you can use in a campaign, and that's humor. So I want to show you this. I'm not sure if we can dim the lights where those are the rest of people falling asleep. Well, let's see if we can get this going. I probably can operate it from here, can it? You know what? Can folks see this relatively well regardless? Blow it up. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Good. We're ready to go? There are subtitles for non French files. Welcome, Mr. Uh, Damages. Riva. Michel Riva. Welcome, Mr. Uh, Gold Rivard. <laughs> uh, gros, je représente un petit festival de chansons, et on est jumelé à un autre petit festival de chansons pour faire connaître nos chansons, mais en France. Alors, pour ça, ben, on a besoin d'un peu d'argent. Of course, you realize that. Um, uh, Le rapporte 11 fois plus son bénéfice direct ou indirect. So, on the heels of this video, which went viral, over 400,000 people saw this video, uh, we went to the polls in Canada. And you may remember that the Conservatives were enjoying a wave of support in Quebec, uh, unbeknownst to a lot of 
us kind of Anglophones that moonlight and go back sometimes and think it's a wonderfully progressive province. It's as riven politically as everywhere else. The center of gravity is more to the left than elsewhere in Canada. But the Conservatives were gaining, particularly in around the rural areas uh, in Quebec. This completely cut the knees out of that support. And Harper's executive decision after this was clearly to pour gas on Quebec and light it on fire because he didn't care about it anymore. And when he went to war during the constitutional crisis decrying separatists and socialists, you'll remember. But, but this is an example of a very scrappy campaign an anti-austerity campaign over $43 million, all of which was restored, by the way, uh, that can work. And I refuse to believe, even in our very difficult times, that we have to fight ineffectively in the labor movement. We don't. But I think what we have to do a lot more is trust our members. I think we have to trust our members a lot more and take risks. And that's not just the union leadership. It's those of us on the left who like to talk to each other a lot <laughs> and don't like to broaden ourselves and don't like to avail ourselves of those official union circles and resources which generations of union activists have built up the unions that we have. And if you feel passionately about labor's potential, then you should avail yourselves of those resources, fight for them, and use them. Thanks for having me today.